Thanks, everyone, for coming out today. Um, I figured since there's so many of us, we should start with some introductions. Uh, I'm Chuck Cox. I teach in the Writing Studies Program, and I'm also faculty director of the Complex Problems Program. Um, I'm Aaron Bosnecker. I'm in the School of International Service. Uh, I am our undergraduate research coordinator, and I teach in research methodology and in European politics uh, and social policy. Nancy Schneider, Department of Performing Arts, and I direct the music program. Tara Gargano, I teach in the School of International Service, and I'm also the program director for online programs. I'm Susina Kogod, I'm an executive in residence, <coughs> excuse me, with a bit of a sore throat. <coughs> I teach in the International Business Department. Nice. So, <coughs> what we would like to do today with you is to make this a very active uh, sort of experience and, and less of a sort of talking head sort of panel, but I do want to say a few words just to give us some context. And I'm going to start with the opening of a sort of classic work, uh, David Bartholomew's Inventing the University from 1986, which he starts, every time a student sits down to write for us, he has to invent the university for the occasion. And I think you can easily substitute a lot of different verbs in that sentence. Every time a student sits down to read for us, to discuss for us, to do research for us, and we can ignore the 1986 era, less inclusive language too. Um, he goes on to say, invent the university that is, or a branch of it, like history or anthropology or economics or English. He has to learn to speak our language, to speak as we do, to try on the peculiar ways of knowing, selecting, evaluating, reporting, concluding, and arguing that define the discourse of our community. Or perhaps I should say the various discourses of our community, since it is in the nature of a liberal arts education that a student must learn to try on a variety of voices and interpretive schemes. To write, for example, as a literary critic one day and an experimental psychologist the next. To work within fields where the rules governing the presentation of examples or the development of an argument are both distinct and even to a professional mysterious. Over the decades since he wrote that, we've learned that not only do students need to invent the university, as it were, but to meet us where, where we are, but we've had to reinvent the university over the years to meet them where they are, since so much has changed since 1986. And our recent move to the new AU core is a really good example of this. As we move from a gen ed program modeled on delivery of diverse content into a core that emphasizes habits of mind, metacognition, and learning transfer, that asks us more and more to break free from our disciplinary silos, we as a faculty have had to become more aware of our own invention of the university. Some of you may have experienced an illustration of this idea just last spring when Tom Angelo conducted his workshop on critical thinking. Uh, during that session, he pointed out just how many different flavors, to use his word, of critical thinking there are, including the scientific method, statistical reasoning, formal logic, and hermeneutics, just to name a few. Well, why does that matter? When we use terms in our teaching, when we assume that our understanding of critical thinking or genre or analysis is the default, we risk confusing students who may have come to understand the term differently from use in another class, making transfer difficult. And when we as a faculty work together, such as to design components of the AU core, we may run up against differing understandings of key concepts, which in turn makes it challenging to say, agree on learning outcomes. In some cases, once we start trying to articulate our own discourse and practice to others, it might become, to use Bartholomew's word, mysterious, even to us. Without shared terms, we can't reach consensus about our curriculum. And yet, we also need to remember that the language we use informs the way we think. When a scholar uses a term, it's not only a matter of precision, it reflects and shapes that scholar's work, the ways of knowing, selecting, evaluating, reporting, concluding, and arguing that Bartholomew reminds us make up a specialized discourse. Does relying too much on shared terms risk flattening out the nuances between fields? How do we navigate between these poles of needing common understanding to work together and serve our students' learning needs, and yet not losing the vital distinctions that mark the work of our fields? These are some of the questions that inform our panel today. And while we have no illusions that these are matters that we can resolve in this <coughs> session, we certainly hope to start the conversation, giving us all things to think about, as well as ways to carry out this awareness of language into our classrooms. And uh, now that I'm done with a little bit of reading, I thought we might, as a panel, talk a little bit about reading. Um, what do you think, Aaron? Reading. <laughs> what, does <that> <laughs> what does that mean? So, yeah. 
Um, I think when we think about that concept or that idea, to me at least, and, and drawing on what you were just speaking in the way that I would think of it in the classroom in the way that I use it in my work, it, it goes, well, probably all of us, well beyond just letting your eyes run over words on a page. It's deeply bound up with the idea of, um, for me, teaching students how to understand the context. Uh, ideas like positionality come to mind of, of both the writer, but also of the person doing the reading. And that might vary. I might read something from one position and then read the same thing from another position. And it would mean or convey different things, or I would pick up on different things. Um, because a lot of my work, at least in teaching research, involves actually studying discourse. Reading to me is also not closely linked to just words on a page, but text broadly defined, symbols, um, things, whether it's monuments, pieces of music, things like that, that can be read for meaning and understood, and things like that. Um, those are a few things that come to mind, at least at first. And I'd be interested to hear what, what others have to say about that idea, that concept of reading that we all toss about, but probably mean or understand different things with. To me, I, I teach decision making. To me, reading, what resonates about reading is reading a situation. Mm -hmm. So being confronted by a series of facts, being confronted by a group of people, uh, being confronted by a situation, as I said, and uh, needing to read it and, and gain insights into it so that a sound decision making, a sound decision can be made. I think my understanding of reading follows very closely from yours, and that in teaching intercultural communication courses and cross cultural communication courses, a lot of the reading that we help our students do is of context, which Aaron also mentioned, and of situations, so that we can understand where cultural differences are, but at the same point in time, better understand that nonverbal communication, that context, and read those situations in a way that don't only allow us just to understand our cultural differences and similarities, but adapt our behaviors in a way so that we can be more successful in those uh, cross-cultural encounters that we have. So reading body language and reading things um, in a variety of forms as well. well. I would say certainly music is an amalgam of all of these things. Certainly if you're playing music with people, you're reading their physicality and watching their bows. And if you're doing research about music, you're applying all these different things. But reading in a situation, a rehearsal situation, we might, well, let's just read through that piece and see if we really want to dedicate the time and the effort to really learning it and mastering it. That's a very different kind of reading because it implies something more superficial, actually, rather than something deeper. I think we're just trying to get through it to assess rather than this kind of more in-depth reading that I think all of us would agree we do when we're reading for understanding and content. So it's just a, a yet another difference of the term. And of course, in writing studies, reading plays a very central role. And a lot of the things that I have heard from my, my peers here you know, apply, and especially the idea of position, that teaching students that reading is not something that is a passive act, but something that is an action. And that to read something is to not only be aware of the words or the images that you're reading, but your own place as the reader. And that not only are Nancy and I going to read a text differently, but I might read a text differently tomorrow than I did today. And seeing reading less as, as a sort of passive uh, basic skill that we learn once and are done, but a continual refinement of an action. And I think it's safe to say that we have a lot of commonalities here in terms of seeing reading as an action, seeing context as important, yet lots of important subtleties in the ways that we use these terms and the ways in which we expect students to use the term. And I think that may just be the key here, is listening to what each other have to say when we use a term. Even something as seemingly straightforward and understandable as reading well, if I use that term in my writing class, and then that student goes to Nancy's music class and expects it to mean the same thing, that may create some friction. But at the same time, we don't want to flatten out to one standard way of understanding it. So one of the ideas that we want to express today is this notion of being aware that there are overlaps, there are convergences in the ways we use key terms, but also very important uh, distinctions and divergences and figuring out to, how to find that middle ground. And now that we have uh, put on a show for you, we're going to ask you, as the audience, to do the same thing. We're going to have you talk your way through some terms of use in our, in our academic world. And before we do that, we should probably come up with some terms. And we, we bandied about a lot of them, but we thought we might open it up to you. What are some terms, some key concepts that inform your work 
do we want to use the projector? Yeah. Or yeah. Like the picture, yes. oh. we just we're just a projector. Right. Oh, we have it right there. Yeah. Okay. Right. Either yeah, or. That's cool. Right. Either or. Well, that's the best handwriting. Oh, uh, well, my mind's <laughs> off. You can use that. We'll so, just type yeah, yeah. While we figure this out, take a moment to think about important terms of use in your field, in your work, and then we'll bring them a list and go from there. Oh, we have one. Yeah, show them all. I can type this in. Critical thinking. Of course. I started off with that one. Yeah. Are we projecting? Yeah. Okay. Yes, okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Knowledge. Knowledge. All right. Discourse. Discourse. Got it. Analysis. Analysis. Good one. Genre. Did you get that? Yep. Right. Others. Application. Application. Certainty. Ah. <laughs> ah. Evidence. Evidence. Good. That's a good combo, actually. Methodology. Got it. Yes. History. These could be words you pick fights over in the hallway. Yeah. Style. Mm-hmm. Voice. <coughs> Research. Positionality. Master. 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 Last positions. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a title. Title. That, yeah. Truth. That's not up there. Okay. How about argument? Do we have authority up there? Yeah, I'll bring up the some of the rest of the ones that we attribution. You'll see some overlap in the second column is starting to fill in some ones that we had brainstormed but not wanting to prejudge what you were thinking about. Do we want to add lexicon? And we were even thinking the word lexicon itself <laughs> nice uh, a nice a nice uh, word. And do we have measure up here yet? Yes, yeah. measures here. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I mean, we could go, we could spend the rest of the session probably coming up with, with even more terms. But what we wanted to do now, uh, and you are not starved for options, is um, we're going to split you all up into groups, and each of us on the panel is going to take charge as the facilitator of this group. And we're going to ask those groups to take one of these words, and we're going to try to divvy them up so that we're not all doing genre or metacognition. Uh, and, and replicate what we just did uh, in a somewhat less rehearsed way. Uh, what do you do in your field that relates to this term? How do you define this? How do you understand this? How does this term inform what you do, whether with students or with colleagues? And see where you can find those convergences and divergences. And they just rolled out this year. All right. Thanks, everyone, for what sounded like some very interesting conversations uh, in the groups. Okay, so what we wanted to do was wrap it up. Are you gonna right. Um, so questions for yeah, us? I'll just introduce this. I think what we want to first hear is not necessarily a detailed report out of everything that you discussed in your group. You just resummarize what you discussed. We'll get to some of those details. Um, I think we'd like to hear from each group member, uh, members of each group, um, first on what that conversation was like a little bit. I think there's three questions I want to pose. One, generally, what was that conversation like? I mean, was there instant <coughs> consensus? Was there disagreement? What was it like to engage with a concept or an idea, a term? Um, that others in your group coming from different <laughs> disciplines, perspectives, positions might have approached differently. So easy conversation, hard, tricky, whatever. The second question is really more concretely, what were the areas of agreement and the areas of disagreement? Um, I think as, as uh, Chuck indicated in the introduction here, part of this comes out of the notion or the question about whether a common lexicon is 
feasible, possible, attainable, or even desirable or, or not. Um, and we'd like to explore that a little bit. So the second question is areas of agreement or disagreement. Did you find some overlap, some resemblances in your notions, or was there, was there not? And then the third question is concretely, um, if you had the chance to discuss it, or even if you brainstorm now, what would you take out of your conversation and put into a classroom or into another setting where these misunderstandings or disagreements come up to use concretely next time you go to teach about evidence or next time you have to explain what you mean by an argument to colleagues or peers or what that means in a context. Um, so if those three questions make sense, what was the conversation like? Where were there areas of disagreement and agreement? And then lastly, we'll come to concrete kind of tips or steps. I'd like to hear from some of the groups and members of the group. Tell us what the term was you were discussing and feel free to chime in. And this can be as messy as, as the group discussions were, I think. <laughs> Please. Well, it strikes me uh, through a particular script then I didn't have it in mind. We are asking students to do this work, which is to think across disciplines and how each discipline works somehow. But we don't do much of it ourselves as a faculty. That there's mm -hmm. not a lot of space for us to actually try to understand what a word means or what an approach, what a method means in a different. At least no space for us to do it. So I think I found it really interesting because it sort of. It triggered my deep, my discipline expertise, but also sort of like, oh, that's interesting that you use the word in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I could maybe use the way you teach that in my class. So it strikes me we're asking the students to do a lot of really difficult work that I don't see a lot of space for our faculty to do. Um, so I, I'm committed to make more space. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just add in, in, in response to that is, is that my reflection on this and using these terms is um, I work with units on assessment of student learning, especially the developing the learning outcomes at the program level and figuring out ways to assess those learning outcomes. Um, and my experience is that there's actually not a lot of conversation about the terms used within the discipline or mm -hmm. among faculty together in their own department so that there could be a you know, learning outcome that says um, students will master effective research methods to say mm -hmm. and I think all the terms in there in terms of what mastery means what effective research methods means and even within one discipline I think there's opportunities for faculty to have more conversations about these um, somewhat messy um, terms. I think in our group, um, we found some synergy, I think, a lot in terms of our uh, work with this credibility. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it's very interesting hearing different perspectives that can help me really think about what the term meant to me. Mm -hmm. I just lie about that. I, mean, just, I, I, I found myself drawn into really big, think, you know, metaphilosophical views with regard to whether credibility emerges inherently from the thing, or whether we can view credibility from the thing. Mm -hmm. right? Which I think applies to a lot of these things across uh, across the board, you know, credibility, identity, and a whole bunch of them, right? Like, are we observing something and, and, and deriving meaning and, and uh, value from that, or are we viewing it with value? So I was in a group, uh, the genre group, mm -hmm. and um, we discovered that there was some overlap, but also some great distinction in terms mm -hmm. of how the disciplines use that term genre. Um, and so I, I, and one of the takeaways for me was that it can be quite useful to have a working concept, a genre is about categorization and awareness of purpose subcategorization um, and the conventions that go along with it in order to achieve that purpose. But there's also, out of our conversation, a kind of a resistance to an institutional standardization, mm -hmm. um, in part because of the difference, the disciplinary difference, um, and in part because it stifles innovation. So I was in either group one or five for an evidence group. Um, and uh, I think at first, because a lot of us uh, 
were coming from social science backgrounds um, or natural science backgrounds. And so there was um, either like some sort of like primary or secondary evidence in the literature and had to do a lot of authority. So there's a lot of agreement. Um, uh, but Cindy coming from writing studies, you know, complicated that um, uh, by talking about other sources of authority. You know, um, uh, and so one thing we came back together on was the importance of audience in talking about evidence um, and how audience adds a sort of contingency to that. I think that applies to credibility and argument in the genre, right? Um, where we're, you know, it kind of depends on who the audience is and what we decide is sort of um, sufficient evidence. Um, our group was discussing argument as our word, and I think most of the, the rest of our group was taking it from a very sort of research base. Like this mm -hmm. is, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing a paper, I'm doing a dissertation. My argument is yada yada yada. Um, I'm going to be teaching <coughs> an AUX course uh, this spring, so my my definition of the word argument, I was, I'm just thinking of it more as the way that students relate to each other, how they disagree with each other, how to have those conversations in the classroom. Um, or you know through 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 papers through whatnot um, in order to be able to sort of come into a place where everyone in the university is going to come from different perspectives and have different ideas and how is how is that an argument versus the more sort of research based methodology argument so I guess that was that was one of the places where our group had had different uh, different approaches to the word that we had. And I mean, I think it was also that difference was really interesting for the conversation going back to the idea that, you know, one kind of institutional definition of, of these things might not be the most productive always because that introducing the idea of argument as a verb rather than all the rest of us talking about argument as a noun, a thing based on evidence, fact, and all those other kind of things you have to then define um, opened up actually a really new and interesting conversation about then what constitutes evidence or fact for different types of arguments and so on and so forth. So. Um, particularly in the context of AUX1, but any classroom, you can imagine having having to have those conversations to better make sure that students understand what we really mean when we say you need to make a good argument or you need to have evidence to back that argument. The other thing that, that as you were saying that it occurred, it happened in our group as well, is if you listen to some of these comments, it becomes almost impossible to talk about any one of these terms in isolation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As soon as you yeah. start talking about argument, you have to talk about evidence. And when you talk about evidence, you have to talk about credibility, mm -hmm. which immediately brings us back to audience. And so it becomes this rabbit hole of, of terminology that, that complicates conversations in any <laughs> singular context. But then when you start to bring people together, it becomes even messier. To write off that a little bit, I mean, to have a constructive argument, you have to have common understandings of two terms, right? A lot of times you find out that a disagreement is really just about two different definitions. I mean, one thing by that word, something else by that word. Observations. Let me ask then, I mean, to think about that third point, we, we kind of broadly agree that there is some agreement and of course some disagreement or difference or, or, or space among the kind of understandings we have of these concepts. Um, I asked our group at least, you know, if anyone had any things they concretely do in a classroom setting or in another <laughs> setting if you're not necessarily teaching to establish a framework or to, to kind of introduce students or participants in the discussion to the discourse that you're in, to go back to the Bartholomew reading. Um, and we came up with a couple, and I'll let you know you all speak for yourselves. But what kind of things, if you have you thought of that, what do you do now that you know that there's this difference, and that not everyone's automatically thinking of the same thing? Um, do you have strategies? Do you do things? Have you thought about that at all? Or are starting to now starting to now exactly, and think what well, what would be useful? So go ahead. I've had my students go out. And I mean, we were in, I was in the evidence group, so I had mm -hmm. my students go out and talk to community, the AU community, they went out to my complex problem students and they just asked different what these different definitions meant to other mm -hmm. people. Yeah. And they were really fascinated to see that, well, they didn't know this that we learned in class. So they were coming from this perspective and that's mm -hmm. their evidence versus this is this other person's evidence when they come to this greater understanding. So it got them thinking that not everyone's at the same starting point, everyone has different they bring different perspectives and different evidence into like their part. And, and I would say that that awareness is perhaps the most critical thing about all of this, is the awareness of that difference and to keep it in mind. And they brought that up basically in every other class while saying that, that oh, well, if only this person knew, 
or how do we get people to know this? Like how, you know, they basically throughout the rest of the semester were just like, we need education, everyone needs to learn this and figure this out. So. How did you practically have them ask others outside of class and how long did that take? It was a class, we did it in class. It was a class period and I came in that day and I said, okay, so what? <coughs> so others were in class, not others outside No, it was outside of class. They left class, they walked around campus, they talked to different professors. Some of them went down to the CBS, some of them, you know, they walked, they utilized the area. That's cool. That, that was really hard. Thought of this before you mentioned it, but in my PowerPoint deck, practically speaking, I'm do this. In my PowerPoint deck, I realized I actually bold and changed the color of key terms that we use differently in my field than in the common sense. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, like, what, when the, I, I work in intelligence analysis, and what that shocked me when I first started working was exploit. We talk about exploiting things right. all the time, it's a positive term. <laughs> and I, I'm just like, oh God, you want me to go exploit this? Right? It means to unpack, to to you know derive value from me from whatever. But like that, that that doesn't have that connotation. That's a great example because I can totally see a class of students, yeah, just frozen <laughs> in the moment. Of yeah. 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 Ten minutes or more lost. Mm -hmm. Practical. In our group, we talked about um, concept mapping, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like putting mind maps on the board. And things. So um, we were talking about using um, social justice or urban, having students sort of talk about like, what does this word mean? What are all the possible connotations? How do they connect? Um, and then we also talked a little bit about the disciplinary difference and sort of helping the students understand that in this context, social justice is going to mean these kinds of things. But you can imagine that um, in a political science class, because your education might mean something slightly different. <coughs> so that idea of practically trying to open things up, but then also start to imagine how they might be recompartmentalized differently at different times. Um, I think was really, but I think the takeaway that our group had on this was we need to be explicit. Mm -hmm. Taking those moments to just really be explicit with us about like why do we need to how do we need here, those sorts of things. What I think I don't think. Building off that, I think that one of the things that we talked about too is that coming to an understanding is not just a matter of the instructor being clear and imposing the definition. Mm -hmm. And while that's very important, it's also important for the students to communicate and reflect upon what it is that they're seeing, learning, and what how they see the differences among disciplines as well. So reflecting upon their own experience and being able to articulate for themselves what they've taken away from that instruction and other instruction as well. I was, sorry, and I was just thinking about what you were saying in terms of not feeling very well, so it takes me a minute to actually <laughs> have things connect. But I do an assign I teach a class in the fall called School for Society. And one of the assignments which I lifted from in, in uh, a faculty and professor that retired is called the meaning of education. So you take terms that you're going to be talking about during the semester, and the students have to write their own definition. Like they pick, I give them two. They have to answer two definitions, but then they get to pick two. So like it might be special education, and then they give examples from their personal life. But one of the things that, um, so that was a really good and eye-opening assignment because I got to see what you know they think culturally responsive education is, or what they think. Um, what was that? Uh, vocational education. And so um, it helps me to see what they already think the terms mean. And then the one that really stuck with me was when we started talking about equality and equity, and we would use some excerpts from Homeroom Book. But the kids, a lot of the students thought that that equality was, that what equity was everybody getting the same thing. So I found a graphic and put it up. And I think that visual helped them to more clearly define. So like there is ambiguity when it comes to certain terms. And I think that was one of the most aha moments for me is that a lot of them felt like equity was everybody gets the same. And I was like, but what if everybody doesn't need the same? So I think language and like is so powerful because knowing what's already here, like the research shows you attach new information to what you already know. So it helped me to uncover and unpack what they already knew and what that meaning of education is like. And I get that like in the first two or three weeks. Yeah. Like we're kind of thinking along similar lines, encouraging you to actually the value of an 
is to have a precise understanding of specific terms that the general public doesn't. Right? Like, like the distinctions that you learn in a particular field are almost what make you competent. You know, the, the terminology itself, um, like, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but it's like uh, people use something like a psychopath, you know, in, in common prose, but it doesn't mean what you think it is, right? It doesn't mean in your actual field uh, somebody who goes out and murders someone. Right? It has a precise meaning that is, gives you more power or access inside that field. Right? Yeah. And then, of course, more complicated when we have students taking courses in so many different fields, what happens when you bump up against a term that's precise in this field in this way and precise in this field in that way? Yeah. So this explicitness and awareness, I think, is key. Well, that gets back to context, which I think keeps coming back right. in all of these discussions of being of paramount importance. Back to the very first comment, we're asking students to do something that is much tougher than what we typically do, and as soon as they can do it, because part of the assumptions that I think that we hold is they must know what this means in some sense, right? We never explicitly say that, or we do this time and time again, and everyone must know what discourse means or equity means or something in the context. So we're asking them to do something very difficult, um, and I think we're also recognizing that we can't assume that there is a common lexicon, so we have to be conscious of these kind of negotiating of these boundaries uh, and differences that we're asking them to do all the time and appreciate how hard that is. And I think just to that point, though, I think part of the, the challenge and habits of mind in many of the floor is we're asking, we're asking faculty to cover that full terrain in 15 mm -hmm. weeks every time rather than, and that, that's not actually what we're asking, asking but it often feels like, well, I can't actually move them from understanding basic <laughs> grammar all the way to full self-reflection and understanding the context and adapt the third. So it's actually across classes, iterative, that actually handing faculty, faculty handing groups of students to another group of faculty, mm -hmm. and those faculty are aware of each other, and mm -hmm. um, sort of having confidence that the, the class before me took care of some basic foundational stuff, so I can go. Uh, but it strikes me some of the, uh, it's, it's hard enough for us to do it, but to say every 15 weeks, every class is going to go all the way through um, is not necessarily what we want, but it's also it's not something we can do. Mm -hmm. um, and I, again, there's very little opportunity, I'm going to make more in my program as I can, to, for faculty to know, well, who are you handing me now? What do they know? Well, it's um, interesting <laughs> that the students then, then become the conduit by which we are able to communicate as faculty. Right. I think that's a crazy concept. But, um, so I'm giving a personal experience, I'm saying that on purpose, uh, with a, uh, we often use the word critique. I want you to mm -hmm. critique this article at freshmen say, what does that mean? I've never been asked to do that. So mm -hmm. I think we need to be reminded that the educational system right now is such that our students across disciplines are not being asked to critique. And we use terms all the time um, with certain assumptions that aren't necessarily uh, valid. Mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. uh, see how many words I can use. Um, <laughs> applying it though in other ways in terms of the so with the other thing I wanted to say we were looking at evidence and, as well as the other group was two groups of evidence yeah and we we actually had a great conversation uh, and one of the questions is uh, that we played with a lot was about whether personal experience counts as evidence and and is it generalizable and so that gets into validity and sort of the point about how they're all connected and. Certainly, uh, then that leads into power hierarchies mm -hmm. and the way in which, in international studies at least, what's considered valid and is really what white men have figured out is true. And Patrick is like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, but uh, so if we allow in marginalized voices or people of uh, you know who are as those personal experiences, at what point, how do we allow that information as evidence to break through some of the hierarchies of power? And I think those are other questions that we need to ask ourselves and not just to replicate kind of uh, what counts as valid. Right, which gives permission for the personal story, especially if you connected it to other sources of other things. Mm -hmm. And just, we got into stuff that wasn't on the assignment, sorry. <laughs> We're but, not. That's good. <laughs> it was really good because it showed that we need to be careful as faculty what we assign, but then allow for the students, mm -hmm. which we were in this context, to go to other places. But we got to stuff about note taking. And Betsy shared an idea that she now going to try having students give their notes as a part of the participation grade. 
which I love because I think we all assume students know how to take notes, and I completely don't believe they know how to do it. They've never been taught. Another thing we assume as professors, faculty, is can students ask questions? Who's, well, who's taught them that? And, and so these things got way off topic, but were so valuable. Because then I'm thinking in classes, don't sweat whether every time a student group or a student responds in the technical way that we want. Learning happens in magical, mystical ways. So thank you, John. Um, since Andrew left, I'm going to um, point to what he was talking about, but also <coughs> what Nancy was um, saying, too, just to circle back. Is, um, we, it's great to figure out what students have done so we can figure out what the handoffs are. And I think talking about shared lexicons is a great way to do that. But if you want to simply know what's going on in the first year, we're doing a shameless plug for uh, a session that Chuck is also in uh, this afternoon, which is talking about what's happening in the first year experience in the foundations courses. So what happens in AUS? What's going on in writing studies? What's happening in conference problems and first year bias? And <coughs> the one, we don't necessarily know which habit of mind the student was taking before they got to your class um, or what sorts of things. But we do know that unless you're working with, um, well, frankly, no matter what the student is, we know what they've done in that first year. And how can we point to that and build off of that in our own classes? That's at least the easy part. The harder part is because you might have social skills and that type of I don't know how to do that. So I know you've all had writing studies. We all had AUS. How can I build off of those things? So go to that session. I think it would be really helpful. That was a great final comment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To, wrap to, to wrap up, but I think turn to the evaluation. So thank ahead. you so much for, for this. This is kind of what we were hoping for. Um, and what's interesting is my, the first session I went to today was about uh, inquiry-based learning. And in many ways, that's what we just did. Um, I, I didn't want us to sit up here and share stories and, and spout research at you, but to have us actually get down into the weeds of this and figure out how it works. And I think we've come up with some really interesting things, not only to, to think about, but also to do. Um, so as we go forth in our new semester, being aware of our use of language uh, in all of the levels of our work. Thank you very much.